two, and three, two. We're live. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott Wakefield, and I have written a title for Silverline Comics, and I am joined, I am honored to be joined, by three creators here, and we're going to be talking about creating independent comics, writing them, and then getting them in people's hands and, and before their eyes. We want to find out how these guys have done it, and we've got an array of experience, and we want lots of questions from all of you because that's what we're here for. We're here to talk about creating comics, and if you're interested in that. Before we roll into introductions here, has anybody written a comic out there or want to write a comic? We've got lots of hands out there. Well, do you have a title for your comic? Uh, stick man. Stick man? And what's stick man do? Uh, he gets uh, yeah. hit by cars. Yeah. Oh dies. my goodness. Okay, so a little bit of violence. And yeah. He dies. Oh, okay, but he comes back to life. Yeah. Okay. Comic. Every comic. Okay. All right. Stick man. What do you got? Uh, I write Among Us comics. Oh, Among Okay. And we have a, a hero or a, a, a Among Us. Among Us. Among Us. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I misunderstood. Among Us. Oh, the, the game. Yeah, my kids play that. Like crazy. Okay. And what we have a, a character that does something. That, um, that the main story? character is like Chris. Okay. He's like new to all the things. Cool. And so does he have to figure things out while he's in a comic book? And, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And what about you? Did you raise your hand? Uh, I just help my brother write the comic book. You know, right? Oh, you guys are family. Yeah. You do the coloring. Yeah. Awesome. So you guys write, and does it? You do the art. You do the art, or you all? Uh, they draw and write it. I just color it in. That's fantastic. And did you do it with? Pencils and that sort of stuff, or do you did do digital? Uh, they draw it, and then some people kind of uh, like do it on the computer. That's fantastic. All right, then that's that's like that's exactly what we're talking about: making our own comics, making really cool stuff that's not like anybody else's, right? So I am joined by Martin Pedro of uh, Cosmic Times, and uh, we've got a couple titles. When we talk, I'll let you do your, I'll do quick introductions if you want to talk about some of your titles real quick. Uh, and then Richard Rivera of Scout Comics, and uh, Stephanie Bunny, and uh, my good friend, my online buddy, and show host, Tim TK, who most recently did Wolf Hunter for Silverline. So, uh, Martin, why don't you tell us about some of your titles? Oh my gosh, uh, I got some titles. I've been in comic doing this for a while. I've been doing this since 2008. Um, my main book is right here. It's Arthur Legend Continues. I, it was what I launched the company with, and I just brought it back for volume two. Story of King Arthur in a post apocalyptic England. Well, my big seller, which we've got to get that second issue done, is Good, the Bad, and the Prehistoric Story of Dinosaurs and Cowboys. People just eat that up. And it's done kind of this Don Blue style of art from the old, I think I don't know, Don Blue. The old, the old 1970s and 80s Disney style. And I, I just put out comics that I want to put out. I try to make my brand kind of me, you know. Pretty much, I try to stick kind of all ages, teenage stuff. I don't, uh, I don't dabble in too much of the, uh, the rated R stuff. You know, it's just not my jam. So that's, that's just what I do. I put out what I love, and I, I run a comic convention in West Palm. So comics are my life. I quit my job in 2015, and been doing this ever since. All right. So it can be done. All right. Barely. <laughs> <It can. laughs> Richard, tell us about yourself. Um, well, I didn't bring any visual aids, so um, I do a few comic books. Uh, Staffy Bunny, Shadow Play, Storm Pirates, Creative Comic, Waffle and Chipper. Um, uh, that's probably most of them right now that are out. Um, and I work at Scout Comics in the capacity right now, co-publisher, um, which is really kind of whatever needs to get done. Um, so I work with a lot of teams now, too, as they're coming in and more of an editorial capacity or maybe even helping them refine their um, concepts or or uh, basically helping with pacing, et cetera. I mean, editorial, uh, uh, some people kind of assume that's more like a proofreader, which that's an aspect of it. But, you know, a good editor is going to get in there and really try to draw more of the story out or to clarify the picture of what that person's representing. We don't interject ourselves. We just make sure that, you know, we know what they want to put on the page. Did they get it there? And just from our opinion, from our experience. So we try to help in that area sometimes. So we work with a lot of people, first time people, um, especially in my capacity with Scoot, which is our all ages line. I would say about 80% of our creators is the first time they've ever been published. Um, one of our creators was 15 years old. So her mom signed the contract. Um, she's now very old, she's 18, so we're looking for more young blood now. But uh, but she's finished up her, she, she, she was the artist, 
colorist, the letterer, the writer. She was the everythinger. Um, we just helped edit a little bit and make sure she got published and gave her those distribution channels, which are also very important. And, and if they use terms up here that somebody doesn't know, feel free to ask. What is that thing? Because we're talking about how the comics are made and how you know, people can read them. And it's Jim TK. Yes, uh, I wrote Wolf Hunter for Silverline Comics, uh, first issue launched this year. Um, before then, I was writing uh, short fiction for anthologies, mostly science fiction, horror type stuff. So uh, I, I've taken all the hyper violence that Martin avoids and, and done that there. <laughs> um, in addition to that, I also work in uh, comics marketing and have done uh, web content writing for various number of companies and I've moved into that full time this year. So I'm also now full time in the, some form of medium of writing. Introduce yourself. Oh, I, uh, my title is uh, Steam Patriots, and Silverline published that. And I've done some editing for Silverline and other, uh, other folks. And um, that's me in my, my comic book world right now. I do have been asked to write something else that's on the way. Uh, it's nothing too official, so I can't really say much about that right now. So, uh, But I like to write. I can't draw uh, to save my life. I wish I could. Um, but I have worked with artists, and I have experience working with the process of creating a comic book. And uh, we'd love for you guys to have questions. So um, the, the process of creating a comic book starts with an idea. And we all have a zillion ideas. And you could be, you could walk down the street and get a million ideas about a grasshopper or a guy who drives a car or a car that talks or a, a flying person or anything. Trick is turning it into a good idea that people want to read. So. Richard, you talked about that. You get people's ideas, and very often, right, they're, they're like a <laughs> shock, and they want to do everything. Well, that and, and or, like, sometimes they've done their story, and they forget that the reader isn't in the writer's head, mm -hmm. and the pieces are missing, or perhaps assumptions are made, that, or, or their characters act as though they've read the script, and yet there's no connection. So it's smoothing out a story, trying to make it accessible, um, I think is a very important thing. Um, also, we live in the age of, uh, you know, first, we always have the first impressions and like, let's just jump ahead. You've got your comic book, you've done everything right. But when the gatekeepers, the retailers, who are the ones that decide to print run pretty much of your comic book, no matter how much you appeal to individuals in bigger distribution, they look at the cover. Mm -hmm. They might read the synopsis, First but, but they they <laughs> might. But they look at the cover. So so one of the things that we you know kind of like internal policy kind of things is like the covers come first kind of a thing where um, we're having several eyes look at what you're going to present in your book because you have the most beautiful book in the world. Nobody orders because the cover didn't catch their eye, which mm -hmm. doesn't sound fair. But that's the re reality of it. We've had books that, um, you know, we're not perfect. We we didn't. The cover looked good, but it just somehow fell just a little bit. The focus of it was a little outside. In this case, in all ages, it was a little more a, not a, a dark colors and not not a depressing cover, but just not as full of energy and selling dynamic kind of fun for the all ages. And that book sold like twenty percent of the other issue that had a much better cover. So um, to tell you one of the, the stories that you just mentioned, um, I just found out recently how Metal Shark Pro, which is one of our books, um, Bob and um, uh, Walter, and I forget everybody's name involved Metal Shark Pro, but Metal Shark Pro I cannot forget. So um, that actually came about from a conversation that we had while they were driving in the car. Um, um, and there was this uh, science program they had watched, and it said that sharks responded to heavy metal music. Um, and so, so they took that one little bit, sharks respond best to heavy metal music, that's their favorite kind of music, to, to metal shark bro, um, which, which, which that story evolved from you know, basically a shark, I, I think, eats a, um, He's like a nephew of the devil or something, and so he's got to pay the price, and they they change him into a and, and all that he wants to be is a shark again. 
but it's a, it's a fun story. He's got a literal, you know, his guitar, his little shark throw is an axe. Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's a lot of fun. But, you know, there's no, there's, there's no bad idea, really. It's just how you execute it. And I, I was recently, I'll quit talking in a second here, but I was recently watching one of those Everything Explained shows. And it's a 24-minute show. But in this case, we're talking about stories. And they were saying, like, fairy tales, like Cinderella, Snow White, all of those that they've been told all over the world, and you actually trace them back to like 3,000, 4,000, 6,000 years ago, um, where all just a few little elements changed. But get your idea. The most important thing about your idea is that you start to write something about it and that you don't wait for, for, for perfection. The next thing you write will be even better, but finish something. That's the very that's step one. Thank you. I love, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, get something finished because you, everybody, their, your internal editor will keep editing and editing, and then either you'll, you'll just get sick of it or you'll never finish it and get something done and then you can work on it. Um, Tim, I know you do a lot of editing. Uh, going off of what Richard said with creating it, what is the, how important is it to have another voice? Uh, an, an editor. So, uh, incredibly important for um, uh, two two big reasons. One is falling off of his last uh, uh, last part there. Uh, there's a quote that gets misattributed to Marshall Stukov all the time. Whoever said it doesn't matter. But perfection is the enemy of done. Uh, so if you know that you have someone else that you can, I mean, obviously you want to put quality in your work, but if you know if there's someone else you can rely on to help them with that. Um, that takes some of the weight off your subconscious, knowing that you, you don't want to be perfect with this first draft. Uh, the second thing, which is, um, uh, especially Wolf Hunter, we're writing a mystery. This is very vital for this. Uh, your brain will want to skip ahead to what you know your next plot beat is. So when you're writing, you will have characters that act like they've already read the script, or you'll assume that the reader has already gotten some clue that you wouldn't put in down the line. Uh, so having someone who's coming who's completely fresh and saying, I have no idea what's happening here. You're alluding to something that doesn't exist. Uh, that is, uh, especially if we're going to anything that has any element of uh, mystery or suspense, uh, your pacing is going to be really benefited from having the second voice come in and say, I'm not feeling suspense here. I have no idea what's going on. Uh, why am I engaged? Well, there's also more to editing, too. There's also streamlining the story as well, because you could start to do all this world building that's not even necessary for that book. I know whoever uh, Andreas is, is the scout now. And you know, these sort of things you just need to trend this stuff out, because it's just that that's filling up. You can have more of that story, more of that character explanation. explanation. It's like the, you know, We've all seen Star Wars, right? What? Star Wars? Is, <laughs> no, it came out in 77. Oh, okay, okay. old movie, okay. Yeah, but the, 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 the often said it was saved in the edit, mm -hmm. that the actual original cut of it was way long and way boring. And I, there's one thing that got cut. Like, we all know Darth Vader's Lord of the Sith. They referenced that, and they cut that, that got cut out of the movie because it was just bad. It didn't, it didn't fit. They don't actually say Sith in the entire Star Wars movie. The original trilogy don't even say it because it was just bad. They didn't need in the story. And that's part of what an editor helps you do. It helps you make your story streamlined, makes it more enjoyable for the reader. My opinion. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's two of all fairies have to be at least. But um, the first five pages of this, uh, which is a super critical time for the reader, is if you're not grab that first five pages and you're reading. Uh, I realized I made a big no-no that I had done a bunch of exposition in the first five pages. <laughs> We won't even talk about this book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the editor's like, like, it's like, I want to put this book down. Like, I hate set pieces, but we should put a set piece in there. And it works very well. Uh, define exposition. Uh, explaining, world building, uh, kind of like Mark said before, you're, you're, you're giving information. And if done well, you know, it helps you build a world and create something for you to be invested in as a reader. If you're just dumping a ton of exposition over five pages, uh, that's when you have the two long monologue where people feel like they're having Shakespeare yell at them. <laughs> but there's something with writing you can talk about laws of two minutes. 
having characters just talk exposition, mm -hmm. which is you try to work your exposition into the story of character names, work it into a natural format. There was a, again, back in the day, there's a comic book, Transformers number one. Have you ever seen this book? There's a two page spread where all the characters that are just introduced themselves to each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like, well, Scott, I mean, Martin <laughs> said, you know, and, then, and then Richard would be like, yes, Martin, I'm Richard, and I, you know, that's horrible stuff. You don't want to put that in your story. But that's, that's higher level, that's writing. We're talking about. Yeah, getting out in the story, 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 story. Can so, I throw something in? Go for it. When you guys are writing your books, because they like the partners can be wrong. Then you guys reference wow. When you're writing when you're writing your comics, do you write a script first and then do the art, or do you just start drawing and try to make the story work? Because that's where you'll do your edit and the scripting versus the art part. Well, what I do is I just come up with an idea and then start making it. Okay. And then sometimes I'll go over it and change stuff that doesn't make sense but makes sense before. Okay. And sometimes you'll have a great story and it just kind of writes itself in just next page, next page. And the, the beauty of comics is you have visuals that can tell the story too. With a, a book, all the words have to say everything. With comics, you have facial expression or action and you can you, you could have a, pages of information expressed with one picture. And so your story can just go along. Um, he, he asked if you write a script. There are multiple ways to write a comic. Yes, Roll and I disagree on this. <laughs> <laughs> so and and just like just like anything, if you have you'll have ten people and there will be twelve opinions on how to write a comic. Um, and sometimes it can line up similar to say like writing a movie. You want to see the pictures you want to write like that. Sometimes it can line up where you have somebody writing every action. If someone wants to talk about the one end, the full scripts to the Marvel or whatever you want to call it, uh, style. I don't know if anybody wants to speak. Full script, guys. Full script. Very much. Yeah. yeah. I was well. So when we say full script, what does that mean? Describing each panel, like page one, panel one. Um, stick man walks into a room. Panel two, a car comes. You see a car in the distance. Panel three, the car gets closer. Panel four, stick man's face. Ah. Panel five, stick man gets run over by the car. There you go. <laughs> and then, and then they'll be like, and then you have kind of when the stick man first in the line says, says, ah, balloon two, and panel six. Why is my life so miserable? <laughs> Things like that. The um, that's a full script. Now Roland, I don't know about you guys, but Roland writes the Marvel way. Because we're old school in that respect, where they just kind of give the story breakdown, let the artist fill in the gaps, and then add the dialogue later, right? Which is bizarre. Right I don't understand that at all, but that's the way he writes, which is a different way of writing. You know? And I'm sure between the three of us, if you look at our scripts, we all have different approaches to how we do it. Before, I'm sorry. Probably format, maybe, but probably a lot of the yeah. pieces are the same. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it also depends on, um, as you have more experience with it, it, it depends on your comfort with the artist and your rapport with the artist and your experience with the artist. I write completely differently for certain artists than I would for another because some artists are very comfortable and um, for me, some artists build worlds with their panels and some artists do very low budget stage plays. And if I'm working with one of the stage play artists, I know that I've got to put, I would like three, you know, as a child room, I would like three Hot Wheels on this thing. I would like there to be a poster of this. I'm like this, and yet there's another artist you can just say it's a child's room, and a little boy child's room who like Transformers, and they'll they'll populate it with things that are you know similar you know to Transformers, something that makes sense. So, um, you know that's another level again. But once you're once you've got your writing down, then it is sometimes good to take into account the person, other people on the team that you're working with. And to add to the word uh, versus pictures, et cetera, et cetera, I think of most comics as like, you know, sometimes a garage band, but it's like a band and everybody's contributing their part to it. And somebody's, you know, putting, putting the, you know, whatever kind of beat it has and somebody's got the lead guitar or whatever, but you've got all those things and they, they're not the same thing. So, to me, the best comics, part of what you write is never, your description never makes it to the page, never need to make the page, because the artist picked it up and shows through the slump or whatever that person's depression or they just dropped 
you know, the rose on the ground or whatever. You don't even have to say anything. You know, they walk up. They they look at it. You know, you don't see what tombstone it is. They they drop a rose and and stand there, and you know, the light changes. They're still standing there. The light changes. They're still standing there. Not one word, but you've got like you know a scene. So um, if you have to say all the words and describe everything in the comic, and the art is completely separate or whatever, then then that doesn't feel like a comic to me. It feels like two people who happen to be in the same page, on the same page at the same time. Well, to uh, piggyback on that, I heard, recently heard an artist, Carlos Carlos Tron. His last name is Tron. I don't know what was that. <laughs> Carlos Tron. He's a, he's in Mexico, and the first time we worked together, I was very descriptive in my script because I know I don't I don't know his style. While I worked on the book, he really said I love drawing this character. This character is Zenora, and so as I wrote the second issue. I added more pages of her, so he would enjoy drawing it. And it's it's because he's he enjoys what he's drawing. He, I'm getting better work from them, him. I'm creating it, and it's not my story. Still is working within the frame that I designed it. I just added some more scenes with her, more dialogue for her to um, to make it something he wants to work on. And he swears that the second issue is his best work he's ever done. So hopefully, I'll, add, I'll put more, burn more for issue three. He's like, I'm going to make a spin off, whatever makes him happy. Because working with him, and then he say, he's giving me better work. But to what Richard said too about the, the bedroom, the bedroom, populating and stuff, this is a lesson I learned a long time ago. You write, you write your story so there's a surprise twist in it, don't surprise your artist. Like when you're populating that bedroom, if you know that in the next issue there needs to be a baseball bat to, to fight off the zombies coming through the window, you have to tell your artist. That baseball bat's important. Make sure you draw it put it in the corner. Oh, by the way, his mom is, is a zombie too. So don't show her face. Make sure we don't, you know, so things like that. You have to, you don't want to surprise your artist in your script. You want your art, you have, you have to put everything in there. It's like surprise, Darth Vader is Luke's father. Sorry, I just <laughs> went with it. Yeah, you know, don't don't make him some, look like he's somebody else's father. You know, things like this, your artist know that you're playing as well. And it's great fun. So as a creator and a writer, knowing from the from the full script, as you build your relationship with your artist, a lot of times you can get things a little bit more loosey goosey. Yeah. Tim, I know I've been familiar with your story. Yeah. And you had you had to be very specific. Yes, uh, because we're doing stuff that you know, uh, existed in a highly documented time of real life where people can get very um, retentive with details. Yes. Yeah. Uh, people like the World War II history. Uh, so. Uh, working on issue one, I had AJ Cassetta at the time, and he um, did the old field manuals for uh, Army Women. Wow. So he was used to finding references for all this old equipment. So when I mentioned it's a Hawker Hurricane manufacturer this year, <laughs> uh, impacted in this way, he knew, okay, we need to put the, uh, uh, I just lost the name of the but we need to put the Merlin engine in there. Not with Allison. You know, the Allison, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're done in a certain way. Um, and uh, I, I knew that about going in, so I was a little bit of uh, building that form beforehand. So if you're not drawing your own comics, if you're working someone else's job later, it can be, if you have the opportunity to, it can be beneficial to talk to them beforehand. Like, hey, how familiar are you with this? What's your comfort level? How much detail do you need me to give you at the time? Um, he said, yeah, just tell me like the year when I can find details about it. So he knew what year of town part of finds. Um, he knew um, how to like do the difference in wingspan between a ME88 and a Junker. <laughs> so super nerdy stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then working with Quentin, who was not so much in that, we did a uh, six page um, special, kind of tangentially related to the main run. And he's not so weird, that's why I'd be a little more specific saying, okay, it's this date, this is what happened in the history book here, I'll include like a reference to send to him, you can research this here. Um, but he wanted to be challenged with some realism, so I'm like, okay, I got a challenge for you, and I'm like, right, this is the interior of St. Augustine's at night. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I just said, I was like, it's, we don't have to put any photos of St. Augustine's at the time, so I said, like, just draw the inside of St. Martin's in the field, because <laughs> it's the closest chapel of that same sort. And he did, <laughs> but uh, uh, working with your artists and communicating, uh, if you're not drawing a comic, it is uh, critical. And knowing your strengths, AJ yeah. is uh, awesome for all your machines. Yeah, it was perfect. If you were doing maybe a fantasy story with no machines, AJ might not be the guy for it. I mean, might be. Um, but so, so we've created, we've collaborated with our artist. 
you guys, I want, I don't want to get past too far past the beginning of creating the, a comment. Does anybody have any questions at this point right now? You guys, and we all understand uh, we're talking about. So these, these guys write. Does anybody draw? I should have. Should have okay. done art. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> then I can save myself a lot of money. If I can draw, <laughs> my goodness. It, but so we, we pass our script off to to a, we see the artist. Usually it's a penciler. And that penciler, you know, with pencils or digital pencils, create the drawings, and then sometimes that artist will cover it with the, the black inks and then the colors, but then sometimes those are other people. So we need to keep collaborating with this team, like you were saying, this, this band of people, and you need to keep expressing the style. For my comments, I didn't want a lot of bright colors, I wanted more muted tones. Yours, you wanted to keep with a World War II feel, you didn't want your Hawker Hurricane to be purple, yeah, no. right? Um, in your stories, if it's a fantasy or if you have a western, same thing. You want to maintain that style. I have a horror, I have a horror story about that. This book right here. The um, it's set in a post-apocalyptic England. You know, because I figured I'm gonna have to know all the technical right. stuff. There you go. <laughs> Everything's destroyed. <laughs> <is true. laughs> and I my my colorist, my my artist worked with this other colors from Mexico. And I started turning art, and the buildings were like pink and green. I'm like, what is this? And then I googled, well. Where he lives in Mexico. Oh, yeah. <laughs> those are pink and green. So he's just painted, and so I ended up trying to recolor as you can see. I ended up trying to recolor as much as I could, but, so he will not be my color. No. Next time, good guy, but we were just on two different pages. Not so right. that's where it, where it runs. If you're not on the same page, you're going to have things like that happen. So you need to have that. You know, sometimes you need to kick Pete Best out and get uh, Ringo Starr in there. You know, <laughs> to make the damn. That's wow. Beatles references. <laughs> you got a lot of these. <laughs> I'm old. We had similar. We had a, an artist, one of I think Barb's um, a divinity title. They're driving across somewhere in the United States, and the landscape was completely wrong. And the comic book world, much like the movie world, when you have diehard fans, they're going to find those details. So if you're best you can, or you write an apocalypse world where the details don't right. matter, you, exactly. you, can, you can you can make it work. So we're working with that team. So then, as it's as it's progressing, talk about some things that might happen in that before your your sign, your check. I love it. Let's print it. What what are the things that happen? Because there is back and forth with the creation, the create, the create for the writer and that artist. Because sometimes the art comes back, and I found in mine I, this is better than I, I imagined, or not quite what I imagined, and so it, it, it takes its life as it grows. You could yeah. just nod and say yes too. <laughs> I agree. That's, 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 I, I, I think I might take that like a few levels down from the people who haven't done comic books at all. Yeah. Sure. Which is, if you're not born into the comic book part of your family, then where do you find an artist? How do oh, you begin great. that top, talking to them? And it's much like you know, it's like much like any other social interaction. You can't just walk up to somebody and. <laughs> You know, hey, do you want to go to the prom or whatever? If that still exists, I don't know. But um, um, which is what exactly I did when I first started trying to find an artist. I'm like, hey, would you like to draw my comic? And I have no track record. No, they don't know if I pay them. They don't know anything at all. And I'm like, no, no, I'm really, 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 really busy right now. So instead, I did what any perfect person would do online now, and I stopped some artists and became their friends. You know, just found their interests. And interact with them and, and people that I had rapport with and had some of the same interesting, like the same things in comic books, etc. Then I approached them about maybe working on a comic book, send the script, etc. But um, it, it's a very difficult, you know, you can't out of the blue uh, go to uh, Deviant Art and just pick the, the top three people and expect they're going to just drop everything and start working on your comic book. But, I think if you're just starting out, one of the best ways is to start following some of the artists that you like, some of the people who maybe um, are still in, you know, going to SCAD or, or are still in art school, um, or they're looking to work with somebody else so that they can grow their experience in the economy world as well. Um, but but you can't, you know, like everything else, you're going to get some no's. Um, you can go to conventions. You can talk to people at conventions, um, but you know that's. I, I would talk to them after you've got a script to work with, something to show them. I wouldn't start with a loose concept and try to hook an artist into that. And then, you know, where do they go from there? 
Unless you're looking for a collaborator and co-creator, which is a whole separate thing. But when you're looking for the artist online, like you're saying yourself, you find somebody, it's not like Jim Lee, you know, always, you know, you like to find somebody who's, who's either where you are just a little past you on, on, on the uh, evolution of, of their career as well. So the price would be reasonable. You know, yeah. because, but I, I have the first, back in 2008, my first run of this, I have pages of a, of a false start to the book that we never, we did up the artist flake and I never had it finished. So I had to hire somebody else. So it's, um, it's best if you have a, you know, you can build a relationship with the person too, you know, be friendly with them. And obviously it's a business, you're giving them money for work, but um, try, try to build that a little bit because you don't want, like my, my creative director, Zach Bassett, I didn't even realize it until he told me, we hired this artist, he actually did all the breakdowns for the book because she had never done a comic book before. Oh, breakdowns, breakdowns, uh, you know, storyboards for movies where they, where they, they do like rough sketches. My, my, uh, my creative director, Zach, he did rough sketches for the book, and the artist went over her the rough sketches because her art style is great. It looks like it looks like old style cartoons, but she never drew drawn a comic before. So he kind of bridged her into drawing comics with that. So there's different ways, all different ways to do it. And um, yeah, there are a lot of artists that that do the pinups and can do those things, but cannot do a sequential page to save their lives. I'll tell you a secret. My buddy Zach, who works for me, he there's there's an artist who works for another company. I'm not going to say who it is or what company. The artist actually doesn't read the scripts; they send it to him, and he does all the breakdowns, and then the artist just draws over it because the artist doesn't do their own breakdowns. They just they just collect the check and, and, and draw over what Zach does. But hey, Zach gets paid for it. So yeah. <laughs> I, I have probably the weirdest thing being my first um, penciler. Uh, you know, doing it. Um, I came in laterally, um, having worked in traditional publishing a little bit, doing my own short stories and, and submitting stuff for publication anthologies, and then getting picked up by the publisher who then said, We've already finished an artist, we just want you to submit a script. Which, a um, uh, quote which no one will probably know it's from, that the best way to work in film is to be an accountant. It's the same sort of idea that we get the lateral translation of. I have experience in writing, and I, I like office head collection, which the publisher knows about. So I, I, if you're dead set on creating a comic, you don't want to write something else. It's a really slow and boring path to go, but I like all written words. So I went some other way, and then I got reached out to it that way. So you didn't start off writing comics? You're writing I was writing uh, short fiction anthologies. So I was submitting to um, traditional publishing houses. See, my background was actually film and television scripting, which, is totally, which yeah. it looks like comics, but it's, it's, it's a very different yeah. world. And my, here's a tip. To, to transition into that from what I knew how to write was it was at the time Civil War was out, the Marvel Civil War uh, comic, not the movie, the comic, um, 10 years before the movie. And I, I found the script online and I ended up just doing, I mean, just like studied it. Hey, so that's how he got that out of the, Steve McDivin was the artist, but that's how he got that out of the artist. And then this is, this is, this is, now this is the exercise I did to then try to figure out how to do that. One of my favorite films was Lethal Weapon. So it's, Way before your time. <laughs> but not the TV show on CW, but there was a movie. And um, Richard Donner, I think, is an amazing director. So I watched that movie and I tried to figure out how I could translate that speed and pace of legal, because it was a very fast paced movie, into comic book form. So I ended up actually have a script adapting like, the first eight scenes from Legal 11. And to figure out how I could truncate, how I could communicate, because my, my background was visual communication of film how to turn that into comics, so I just kind of reverse engineered it, and that's how I figured out the right comic. And still, even if you look at my first comics, a lot of dialogue, way too much dialogue. My first comic is very prosy yeah. descriptions. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's a process, learning how to write comics. It's its, its own separate thing. Whatever you, whatever writing class you took, comics is, slight, is different. <laughs> we, have a, we have a program uh, where, where the script comic uh, winners come to scout and we and we work with them and, and do comic books and we get screenplay writers basically or television writers for the most part um and they've got a script but it's not a comic book and um and and, and that is actually some of the most involved in most amount of time editorially or whatever i've spent trying to teach somebody how to write comic books um some students Learn more quickly than others. Um, I, I had, I did have one one person that, um, you know, just after maybe two or three weeks of several hour Zoom calls, 
a few times that each week. Um, after about 30 hours of that, um, they start handing in pages that were pretty much ready to go. I mean, with just little tweaks. So um, I, I think with all of this, the thing is, don't get frustrated. Um, you know, they do say, you know, can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. But, you know, but you can at least uh, express your story, get it down, and then invite other uh, eyes on it, other opinions. Because we've had people write stories, and, and honestly, like some of the leaps in logic that we were talking about earlier was just like, so this character already knows that this person's in distress, even though they just saw them walking down the street and they didn't seem to be in distress. And oh, yeah, that's, that's why they just searched them on the, on the uh, missing person's data list. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, so, you know, the thing is to, if you're open to criticism um, that, that's respectfully submitted, you know, if you're open to criticism, that's going to be very healthy. It's a very good way of learning anything. Um, so listen, they're not always right. And um, if, we, if, if there was one set of rules that would write the perfect, you know, 100,000 100, copy comic book, then we would all just be doing that. So there's, there, yeah, sure. But there are many, you know, many different paths to it. You never know. Um, I won't start dropping forty or fifty year old indie comic names down. But you know, you never know where. You know, I mean, speaking of Cerebus. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Cerebus, uh, you know, or or Crumb's work, or you know, you know, or uh, you know, I mean, even Flaming Carrot, whatever. You don't know what direction where you're going to come from. Um, and the main thing is to enjoy it. You don't do it with, please, for comic books, don't do it with thinking I'm gonna get rich or that this is gonna become a movie. Write a comic book to write a comic book. Don't write a comic book, in my opinion, so that it can be something else. Do what you do best. Put your story out there and, and somebody else can step in, just like the reverse of the script to comic or taking a script and making a comic. Well, comic, you, you probably need somebody else to make that into a script. It's a whole different sure. presentation. I got three kinds of on the three things. Three things. One, we mentioned about the character and understanding, you know, what they're doing. Also, writing comics is you can't have a you can't have panel one. He sees her across the room, runs after her, fires his gun twice, trips over trips over something and falls to the ground. That will not work. It's, that's a whole page of a comic. That's that's not just one panel. So that that's a thing you see a lot with early with first time writers. So they'll understand that. Two. Like you said, have someone check your work, but it can't be mom or dad. It can't be cousin Larry or Balky. It can't be hey, It can't be uh, <laughs> your best friend. It needs to be somebody who's impartial, who doesn't mind hurting your feelings. And that's where I had about three of them. one of my scripts because I, I knew he'd hurt my feelings. <laughs> and the third thing, like you said, comics, it, it's a hard, it's fun, it's rewarding, but if you don't love it, if you're not into it, if you're if you're into something else and you're just doing comics because you want to break, get to that other thing, just do the other thing. Just skip over the comic part because if you don't love it, it'll break your heart. You know, it'll break your heart if you do love it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it'll it'll spit you out pretty fast if you don't love it. You need to. It needs to be a passion. You want to tell stories in this medium. Just like I want to make music. Well, then that's your medium. It's making music. I want to make movies. That's your medium. I want to make comics. That's its own separate medium. It's like. Music, movies, TV, and comics is a separate thing as well. So that's what I have to add to that. You want to keep going with the the, the, the steps? Oh, do we have any questions? Yes, sir. So going. when uh, writing a script for a comic, in terms of like the written word versus like putting out on the illustrated pages, how do you sort of structure that for the pacing of like twenty something pages? Like, how do you sort of avoid undershooting or overshooting? Kind of. It's always good to know how you're. Well, if you're writing a continual series where you need that cliffhanger, just know where your cliffhanger is and build your way, kind of build your way back to the beginning from there. That's my, my philosophy. You know, know how each issue, like I know for this Arthur series, how each issue is going to end before I even started writing anything. All three issues, how they end and begin, end and begin, and then I just fill in the gaps. And it, I've shifted some stuff around. Like actually, the ending of the third issue has changed since I started writing it because the stories evolved a little bit. But it's still that format. We're still heading in a similar direction that we were when I started it, and uh, I think that's the key. Like always, 
if you just writing a novel is one thing you can start writing a novel and not know where it's going with a comic you only have you know 20 to 22 pages and you have to fill it with the content to get to those points you have to know in my opinion other people i mean they're all who knows they, um, <laughs> you kind of have to know where it's headed when you're doing it in my view you guys agree yeah. i'm a, a huge outlander which uh, if you're you know if you're working for a big luxury movie wants like weekly releases or canceling out of it but like don't have it stress on me. So I can take time to actually outline saying pages one and two are this, pages one, two, three, and four are this, pages five and six are this, and then I can script from there. So I've already created my roadmap, and then um, it, I know exactly, you know. It also gives another step there for the editor to say, like, well, based on what you're already creating, unless you do something really drastic, this is going to be a dead page, so you need to like change what is fits in your, your outline. Um, so uh, I do that for, for every issue that I script. If you have an extra page, well, it's a two page spread. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, speaking of outline, I, I do like that. That's an outline for a new book yeah. I'm working on. It's just page one, this happens. Page two, that happens. Page three, that happens. You can present the camera. Maybe. And, and then, yeah, sure. and then, <laughs> and then <laughs> I don't spoil it. And then, and then I'll go back in and I'll, and I'll, I'll keep fluffing it. I'll keep adding to it. Then I'm like, well, it doesn't work. So I'll take that out. So now we have an extra, again, an extra couple yep. pages. I can put something else in there. And I, and I, build, I build it that way. Like I, I wrote. Um, I think I wrote this book in line on that. Um, one of my no, one of these, one another comic. I actually wrote it on my phone in line at uh, Disney World, waiting to get on that flight of passage. <laughs> That's a three-hour wait. I'm gonna do something to be done. Right? Yeah. So I, I, I broke out a whole issue of a comic that way. It might have been this book actually. I think. So that's you know. Yeah. That, that, it, to answer your question, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. I, I like to do the end. Mm -hmm. Frequently though, you'll get to you'll get to that three-quarter point, and sometimes you realize, wait, this is a good end right here. This is a good beginning to the next sometimes. It, they always take on a life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but some people are strict outliners, some people are seat of the pants, and a lot of us find a mid ground. The outline helps, it keeps you, it gives you the parameters to work in. Well, I'll say this uh, I, I believe in writing, again, this is writing more for writing class, but I believe in writing about something. Have something to say when you write. Don't just write, hey, it's a fun comedy. Try to say something with it. Like um, when, I, when I actually started writing this book, it was 2010. This miniseries, and it had a very—it was—it was kind of critical of the media was where I was going with it at the time. Yeah. Looks like I was right. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> but now I'm, I'm in a different place, so that's why the ending has changed because I want to say something else, something different at the end. I want, to, I want I want the point to be stronger towards something else, not political. I'm not, I'm not trying to be that guy, but I, I want to at least say something or bring a point across, like. Um, we have another book from Blood. It's about a super proud mental patient, and the story is really about losing faith. Not, not necessarily religious faith, but a faith in, in something. And you're trying to you're trying to get that faith restored so you believe in something and you have a purpose to live again. Um, but it's a story about a super proud mental patient. That's pretty cool, man. It's, it's crazy, he's got superpowers. But there is a, there's a point to it, ultimately. And if, and I, when I write, if I don't have a point, it's, it's not a point. There's no, it's hollow to me. You know, that's why I used to write for infomercials. <laughs> There's not a point there at all. Okay, question before we keep going, we're going to keep talking about creating and then getting those comics into people's hands, right? So, so we've we've got our artists, we've got, we've got a good team going, we've got the art done, we've got all of the pages back, which we can go back and talk about details of that if we want. But now we've got a completed story, right? And it's most likely digital. Um, in the one form, one way or another. One way or another, we have we have digital images going back and forth. And we're going to put them all together, and uh, you will probably need somebody. That, I don't know how to do that. That is not my skill set uh, to make that happen. Um, so we don't need to talk about the details of that. But we have got it done. We have got it ready to be sent out to the world. Have I and printed it? Printed and, 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 printed and ready. What are the pitfalls? What's the worry about that? What is the the what need, what do you need to know about? Do I want to fill my garage up with box of comics? I have a garage full of box of comics. Right. right. Do we? <laughs> the um, I'll tell you, when I, I I started in two thousand eight was when I started working in comics. It is a different world. It has changed drastically in just just the what is that fourteen years thirteen years? The um, Kickstarter has, has has changed the game. Uh, you guys know, anybody, anybody know what Kickstarter is? It's a crowdfunding so it's a platform. You go online, you, you say, I, I give this much money to your program, and then when the book's finished, they ship the book. 
The, um, that has changed the game entirely. Uh, for example, I have a book called Decisions. I do one shots of this. And they're, they're slice of life stories with supernatural elements. And they've always been critically well received, and I've always sold them well at the convention. So I went to Kickstarter on it and totally flopped. It's just that it wasn't something that appeals to the Kickstarter audience. So that goes back to what you're saying. Or someone, if somebody said, you need to write something that's an appealing concept too, with a nice cover and a nice title. So like Metal Shark Row, oh, I want to know what that's about. Yeah. I mean, just, and again, hey, there's an example. Indie Comics, where all the independent comic guys. You know, I heard Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that was a black and white independent comic back in 84. It has a cool name, though, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They didn't even have a, an issue two plan. Right. Diamonds like Colin Hecky, then we sold this out, it sold so much, it's worth, what's issue two coming? They're like, run the issue two. Issue two. And now those guys are from one of them, and the other one. Well, I'm going to go way back for a second, then come right back. Um, when, when you're writing something, for me, because I mean, I've written uh, comedy, drama, or layered horror history, intricate kind of thing. So you can write differently too, depending on what genre you're in or what your goals are. Because um, I write, I, I can't, I mean, the people that say, oh, I write a comic book in, you know, I don't know, 10 hours, I write a 30 page comic book. Like, wow, that's amazing. Um, like it might take me two days to write a page if it's a very detailed, long, which you should never do. But I did 36, eight, 36 issues ahead of time, kind of which you're right. I never do that. But no, yes. Okay. If it's if it's um, like just comedy, I've I've I have written um, a, a comedy thing in like maybe eight hours or something of, of writing. Um, but it just it. it Seems funny to me, at least, and I'm just moving right through that. Um, going to the back closer to the present here, or like, well, you've got your comic together, what do you do now? Well, maybe you don't even print it. Maybe you do now web. Is, yeah. Maybe web you, know, you do web comics because we've had a Same number of people that do web comics. They build their audience free web comic, free web comic. Oh, now I'm going to print it if you would like a printed version of that. And they start out with an audience of 30,000, 40,000 people. Well, Laura, have you ever heard of Laura Olympus? I mean, that lady, she was, she was a webtoon, and now she has a best-selling book because of her webtoon following. So, so maybe you don't print it at all, but if you are going to print it, now um, there, there are so many more options. Um, I would suggest not doing what I did. I'm just very lucky, but because um, I went from um, a comic book, I, I need to print at least 2,000 of those. And so I did, and it turned out OK, but over time, all right? It was 2000 overnight. No, I mean, uh, no, I, uh, and here's the other thing. If you're, if you're marketing yourself and going to conventions, I'll, I'll tell you, I went the first convention I ever went to, and I mean, I started out, I didn't want to have just my comic book. So I had three covers of that thing, so they could at least choose that. I had like 15 posters, I had t shirts, I had stickers, I had a standee already of this character. So the very first time I ever came out, it was just ready to go. And I sold like 12 comic books in three days. That'd be heartbreaking. It was yeah. questioning your life choices. However, I had another comic book convention that I just barely got back in time to retool. I took what we should use for use defense posts and whatever. Yeah. I built shelves, and did things, that, yeah. um, converted over, got a really good spot, which that matters too. I was on the lead of Art Artist Alley towards the food court, and I sold like 300 comic books. Oh, yeah. That was my end. Superman. Yes. yes. That's always been a good show. I had been a good show. So, so, you know, so then I'm like, well, this, that's, this is okay then. Um, and everything else has been in between. But um, uh, probably a wide range of in between. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wide range of in between. There's so many factors. But, you know, um, I, would, I would say there's so many like blams, and, and you can just do a search and see and, and see what, they, what their rates are. Uh, some of them will help you format your books, mm -hmm. or you don't even, you know, you've got your files and they'll still put it in there. Template. Template on there. I think all of them have templates now. Yeah, when you just drop those in, and you can, you know, it's affordable to print 50 or 100 of something, right? You know, um, I, I would suggest almost anybody probably start out with that. And even if you do like supremely well and you sell out of them immediately, then you've got your first print run of 100 that everybody's going to be after, mm -hmm. you know, later on down the line. But to what you said about printing 2,000, it seems like, well, wow, I printed 2,000, it's only 40 cents a book. That's a great deal. But it's a little, it is like heartbreaking to look at 
you know, 2,000 comics and you've sold 10. And you're like, well, uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of this, there's a lot of morale out to making comics. You gotta, you gotta struggle to keep that up. Right? Yeah, like, uh, it can be heartbreaking. And I'm sure we've all had those dips where it's like, oh man, it's one of you know, uh, them. Here's, here's an example. When I started out, again, PVC, you know, we, we didn't know. They didn't pop up in the really even a thing when I started out. We were building everything out of PVC. And I, there was a guy, I can't remember what his comic was, but he had this beautiful display of lights and banners and had one comic he had published. Big, big custom table that the whole thing up. I'm like, why do you cost a fortune? Yeah, I paid out a credit card. We'll make it back. One year later, he was out of business. And I don't know how he was paying that credit card off. So you, you want to jump in and you want to dump, but work, work into it. Work, work, you know, like, hey, start be off true to your own budget. budget. You know, be realistic. Yeah, it's rich with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> don't don't buy from one you too on on the outset. And I like that. Start start a get a fan base if you can for for free or whatever the cost of of, of a web address is. Yeah, or even the webtoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can hey, do you have Tumblr? It's kind of dead now, but Tumblr used to be a place for people to start doing webtoons. I guess probably Instagram now is where it's at. Yeah. And, you, and then you're not limited, but that, well, that's another going back to writing and pacing. You can change your pacing if you're doing one page a week, or it, it doesn't have to come to an end and wait for issue two. You will need breaks, but the, the pacing can change. It's another consideration, but it's a free consideration to build that fan base. And then once you're ready to print or both do something new, you have that fan base, or to approach a publisher. A lot of publishers now would like the fan base already there. Right. It's difficult. It's, it's kind of tough. You feel like you need the publisher before the publisher wants the fans and want you to bring them with you. So you build that build that fan base to show you've done the work. Well, it was a couple of years ago, was like five years ago, that I was heard that publishers were looking at people's social media following yep. as, as a determining high factor for hiring. As an old guy, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, oh, that's a thing? OK. You know. That's what they want. Oh, guys, we're getting down to that. The last five minutes. Oh, sorry. Oh, that, no, this has been great. So um, I want to have, uh, what, if there's any more questions out there uh, about the, the craft of making, of uh, turning an idea into a story people can read, of the uh, of actually selling comics, and comics marketing the comics, um, how do you turn your, your cool ideas into a bigger story? Uh, I, if you have something last minute, if not, I've got just, I wanted to ask, what, what do you guys think? That independent comics have that the really the two big guys don't. What's the advantage of being either lean and light, or or <coughs> what what sets indies apart? Not the money. Not the money. I said money, but true. Yeah. Money, but I also, yeah. also said uh, not the old and the can. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like if you compare it to like the big studios like Disney, where they're very machine driven. Their, their product is very. Sanitized to a point, it fits very specific box checks, very specific boxes. Like as an independent, you, you don't have to check those boxes. And I'm doing the comic where you read it upside down, yeah. and it's going to dark ink that at night it's a different story or something. You can do things like that. Where say the bigger guys they don't want to take those risks. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we can do jump back to further point on communicating with your artists and and the coloring. Choices for a comic. Uh, for Wolf Hunter, we didn't want to have some old realism to it, of course, but also uh, I am a sucker for French and Euro comics, okay. and so we got a, a Colors 2 does that. And so there are moments where we just have very emotional, it's like color, like just color drops or whatever. And so, you know, it's not something you're going to get in Marvel if they're, like, they're in their main line, maybe they do it in Hoshu, but it's all right, we're doing this like uh, World War II spy story as a French film. Okay, sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we, we should we should do a whole panel on the difference between American comics and yes. European comics or Japanese comics. There's to all different worlds of comics beyond what we just see in this country. Yeah, that's 100 percent true. And the more I learn about it, the more I feel small. <laughs> but, but, but there's one thing I have, I have to throw out there because when you're getting your comic book team together, one thing that can be overlooked almost it, 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 it's best. It's best done when it's invisible. Is your letterer? Your letterer uh, can yeah. kill your comic book, or your letterer can save your comic book. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have had submissions 
where everything was perfect and then the lettering was so atrocious it just struck everything down like eight levels there's an art form to it yeah absolutely don't underestimate <clears throat> even though they're the least paid per page you know up here at art team goes yeah, artist like you know artist colorist letterer um but oh well then us yeah, yeah, nothing, yeah, nothing, but, nothing but um yeah yeah, yeah yeah it's like here's our, our here's our the rinds yeah. our oranges we just had yeah. we would like to suck on those for some flavor <laughs> um but uh but but don't underestimate lettering lettering is so critical yeah letter will complement the art because the letter controls your item movement below the page because you read this balloon this balloon and then they should work around the art and keep you flowing with it. It's a whole thing. It's, I, I, I can't do it. My letterer actually, he even had some suggestions about break, breaking the two balloons or giving this dialogue to somebody else in his line mm -hmm. so it, it paces over. And Sometimes they do. That's a good, if you've got a good team, you can trust them to have this. You know, this well, also, when you're writing your script, if you've written a page, a panel, or whatever that has a lot of dialogue in it, make sure your artist knows no, you the good. lettering. Or you'll end up by having people's faces have to cut the balloons yes. and stuff. Or you'll have to shrink the panel up with some weird balloons. Right, right. Uh, we, 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 uh, indies can can do what they want, really. And it can be a colossal flop, but, but you're not going to throw up, you know, it's not going to ruin Iron Man. Okay? You, know, it you, have your, you have your interesting idea, and you, okay, that would be Or it's childhood. Right. Yeah. Or you can be, have an amazing, cool, goofy idea. Metal rock, rocking metal sure. shark guy, and and uh, and it's awesome. And so it, it it's independent. It's the freedom to do and and, and new. Can I say something contrary to this? Of course, it's not. I'm not being a contrarian, it, and it's it's, not, it's, a, it's a philosophy I wrestle with. I was um, independent comics is a great title to put on things, and we call it independent and, and hashtag indie comics. But I was doing the super comic, ironically. And Mike Broder used to run Supercon. And he said to me, Martin, why do you keep calling yourself an independent publisher? I said, well, because I'm, a, I'm not normal. He said, I'm a small yeah. press publisher. He goes, but aren't you competing with Marvel and DC? You'll make those dollars. So think of, your, think of yourself, Scout, too. Think of yourself as a, public, as a publisher on the same level with them. Because when you're putting out a comic, and especially when you get into distribution, mm -hmm. your competition is Spider Man. You're competing against Spider Man, you're competing against Superman. And even now with Kickstarter, you're competing against comic professionals, and you're on. It's a level playing field with Kickstarter. So, yeah, I think independent comics is a great moniker to use, but it's it's a don't let that mindset hold you back either. And think, well, I can sell for less for lower quality art because I'm independent. <laughs> you know, try to be as try to be as close to the quality, not necessarily their sanitized corporate storytelling, but try to be close, try to get your quality up there as high as you can. I'm still the line of scout, of course, that was put out comics that are on par with uh, some of the DC comics, but with crazy concepts like Revolutionary Wars mixed with Steampunk. I would like to put that out, but several of or a homicidal uh, bunny rabbit. Yeah. And that, that's, 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 Scout will put that out, Marvel won't, but the quality is there. The quality's been there since day one, even before he was with Scout with his book, so. Bitten in the pants. I saw that first copy. <laughs> <laughs> even before seeing that, we are. No, I, I got a good what question. Yes. Kind of the, go up, kind of off with that. How does it go from being an independent, where it's your comic and all that, then you go to you join Scout Comics or you join Silverline, and then it's not really your comic anymore. It's Silverline's comics or it's Scout Comics. And you, it, and you it, 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 it depends. It depends on your agreement with the publisher. I mean. Um, that's that's another. I mean, again, all of these topics could be could be their own panel. But um, look over. I mean, there are very predatory contracts. There are there are less so and better contracts. There are people who want to sign your comic. They instantly own fifty one percent of the IP. There are people who have zero. Scout owns zero percent of your IP. So Scout does not. My comic at all, but the contract gets Scout makes certain amount of dollars off of it, and you make certain, yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, like publishing rights for a certain amount of time or whatever, it's all in the contract, so it's not like it's not like a, a, a switch on or off. It's like some people have signed with, with a company, and that company now controls the IP, can do anything they want with it because they own 51%. And by the way, we just aren't going to let you print anything for a while and just sit there for 10 years, exists. 
And then there's also, you know, I mean, like half is what you it's like, oh, put our logo on your comic and print it yourself and you do everything yourself. <laughs> and 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 we'll say that we're publishing it. Um, so there's a big, big, big range. And again, like like with Scott, the more the more any publisher, the more risk that they're taking up, so the more higher percentage of the final paper. Like if Scout's paying to print your book, distribute your book, obviously they should get a cut of it. They should they shouldn't expect that you're gonna get the entire amount of the issue sold because they've taken the risk. Yeah, you did you've done the work, but that's already done at that point. You know? yeah. Excellent. I was gonna say before we wrap up, before we wrap up, um, any word of wisdom, um, I'll give you a second to, to think about it because um, what you said about get the work done, that's my word of wisdom. That's the way I got my story. Finally, oh, I wrote the beginning, middle, and end of a story, and I had a story, not parts of a story. So I was able to polish that, and it started off as a, as, a, as a novel, and not quite a novel, but I had a beginning, middle, and end, and it, it ended up becoming a comic book. I would have never seen that, but it wasn't until I had it, and I could say, this is the beginning, middle, and end of my story. Please, please look at that. So that's my word of wisdom for creating a story. Anybody else? Any words before we, we wrap up? Pay your artists. <laughs> Pay your artists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'll put enough of this out there. Um, I know when I, before I started, I went to Megacon, which is a big show in Orlando, and I bought every independent comic I could find because I wanted to see what everybody else was doing and see, see if I could even match up to that level. And I felt like Maybe I was wrong because <laughs> I'm still not rich. But the um, but yeah, I, I, if you're going to be an infinite comic creator, you're going to be a comic creator. You can support other comic creators. So like when these guys are out selling, hawking their book, that's paying for them to be at the show. You know, so go go buy some sober black comics. Not that Trump's going to buy this. Anymore. <laughs> but the um, <laughs> but support you study other, support obviously support your fellow creators, but also use that as a learning tool. Buy their books. You know, this is garbage. After, oh, this is really good. I need to hone my skills to be better than that. And so you understand the market you're getting into. At least that's my advice. That's why I did when I first started off in 2000, no, in 2007. Yeah. I spent a fortune writing into the comics. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, like what like we've said a couple of times, but a different way to say the same thing. Um, you know, know when, know when that story is finished. And I, I tend to want to move on. You know what I mean? Going to do your next comic. This one wasn't perfect. You've already printed it. You've done it. I would be very rare, though, to consider going back and revisiting or redoing uh, a comic book. Maybe a point or two, if the story evolved and it needs to, to fit with the continuity that way. But for the most part, consider that done. What's what's next, and then move on to your, your next story. Yeah, don't focus on trying to fix what was done. Just do better next time. Learn from it. Do that. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you. You guys know where to find them at their booths. So go say hello. By the lines over there. We're over, We're over there. They're over there. And chat, keep keep the conversation going. I, we love talking about this. And the whole point, the whole idea of, of the convention is we all love this this world of storytelling and comics and, and creating. And let's help each other do that. It's a community, man. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you.